A day passed with its steady and pleasant reliefs, a sometimes parallel universe for them, and on the next morrow Peter, reading the newspaper and drinking orange juice, waited in the cafe for his angel of dawn to arrive. She soon came, staunch and loyally reliable, and they ordered coffee, eggs, and sausages. I started writing the story of a day, said Peter, but I only wrote midnight to 7 a.m. so far. It's mostly evanescent as it contains some dreams. Please read it, Peter. A day in the period that it subtends is the cyclic unit of time, a pearl pure and round and complete in the necklace of months, a bead worn smooth. The days, polished by the clacking of time over the cobblestones, distance themselves like echoes absorbed by the night into the rosary of the seasons. My day begins at midnight, the time when a day lives and dies as the date changes unseen on a timepiece, a watchfire reborn from its own embers. Good start, Peter. Good metaphors. I lay barely awake reading the waves of sleep seeping ever closer in circles, it seemed, lapping at me as my book fell toward the bed and once even to the floor. The cat had succumbed hours ago and slept snuggled and purring with a paw across its eyes. Summoning one last motion out of the deepening paralysis, I stretched for the lamp and drew the darkness over me and rested warm and naked between the sheets. The mini blinds sliced the moon and I bathed for a moment in the stripes until I turned away from the light and drifted toward darkness. I thought of the pine tree under which I would sleep, next to the old stone wall in my dreams, my recurring haven of repose, in a securely warm cocoon of the snugness of a sleeping bag. Here I would be utterly removed from even the touch of God, my body and spirit proximate to a new radiance, that of the day's heat emitted from the stones back into the night air, while two in sleeping would absorb from nature whatever it was that was renewed afresh each night through the mysterious black conduit. With one last look back to the day's events, I yielded to the sweet delight of dreams. I like the stone wall too, Peter. It's so country. But, my deep sleep within a sleep upon layers of pine needles would have to wait because the adventures and daydreams of the day, like pine needles on end, prodded my sleeping brain with their ever-pleasant spikes. Sleep circle had closed to a point and reopened on the other side, taking me through its black hole and into another universe. It was good flying weather. There was even a draft flowing up the slope of my backyard. Like kites, we gently lifted off and drifted down the long hill, floating, spread-eagled like flying squirrels, the ground falling away under us as we, gravity's children of the ski jump, were called home by Mother Earth. But then, closing our fingers and thus making up for the lack of webs, we cupped the wind to rise even higher, hundreds of feet up, ultimately, into lofty and precarious flight. Devil dared, we sailed without the usual four-limbed, shooted canopies that most flyers wore, which, although they made for surer flight, often caused flat-on-the-face landings. We real adventurers wore minimum shoots, or, as on days like today, none at all, and figured the updrafts from the contours and temperatures of the land and, every now and then in apparent foolishness, compacted ourselves into swimmers' cannonballs and plummeted for fifty feet or more before spreading and flaring on the cushion of full-surfaced air. My consciousness as a passenger rode with me, for I had practiced dream awareness and control, and so an event that would be normally little more than a remembrance now became a living and conscious thing. I rose heavenward, alert and appreciative, a spectator mounted on Pegasus, riding the thermal drafts and observing everything like the all-seeing eye atop the all-knowing pyramid, one looking both inward and outward. Peter, do you often dream about flying? Yes, though sometimes I have to flap my arms to get off the ground. The night flight was lovingly interrupted when you joined me in bed. I partially awoke. You were refreshingly cool and nestled lengthways to me, skin to skin. We were a pair of golden spoons. You touched my lively and intimate part, 
stroking its full extended length, sometimes pausing to scratch my thighs, I turned and caressed your mounds, first one and then the other, back and forth, massaging your hair and scalp with my other hand. You were soon wet below the waterline and you steered my rudder, already moored nearby in the flanket dock, into that safe harbor where the waves originated and sought the open sea. Here in the surf between sea and shore, I rolled and tumbled a long time with the swells of anticipation and finally, in an eternal celebration that was compressed into a few timeless seconds, felt the full breath, depth, and width of infinite release. Peter, do you often dream about flying? Yes, though sometimes I have to flap my arms to get off the ground. The night flight was lovingly interrupted when you joined me in bed. I partially awoke. You were refreshingly cool and nestled lengthways to me skin to skin. We were a pair of golden spoons. You touched my lively and intimate part, stroking its full extended length, sometimes pausing to scratch my thighs. I turned and caressed your mounds first one and then the other back and forth massaging your hair and scalp with my other hand. You were soon wet below the waterline and you steered my rudder already moored nearby in the flanquette dock into that safe harbor where the waves originated and sought the open sea. Here in the surf between sea and shore I rolled and tumbled a long time with the swells of anticipation and finally in an eternal celebration that was compressed into a few timeless seconds, felt the full breadth, depth, and width of infinite release. Interesting, Peter, and I love the water motif. Water is love's element. Heavy sleep soon called me, the bed gravity having at least quadrupled, and I sank, embraced, into that oblivion of sleep from which I'd confidently return. I dreamt of a small tropical island only a few feet wide, supported it seemed only by shimmering and sparkling diamonds in the pure blue sea. I was joined by my confidant and from here we reigned over the social empire we'd created, one that stretched around the circular horizon like gleaming jewels. Friends going about their bright business of living life, sparks amid the dullards, gems reflecting value and meaning. Further out the sea was a golden bronze, and there the spawning whales blew their spouts as they came up for air. We sat wordless, aligned and comfortable, letting the sights flood into us, filling us. There was no other purpose except to look. As in life, there is no other purpose but to live. Now and then I would wake up and in that brief interval replay my dreams so as to engrave them into my long-term memory. The next dream was a chase dream. These were always welcome and were always especially exhilarating since I could never be caught. Let's hear it. We were climbing redwood trees next to an old cathedral somewhere in Brazil. The building was a block long and apparently unsteady for as we stepped onto it from the trees it began to tilt forward, tipping like a sliced loaf of bread and I, thinking fast, ran to the falling front and bounded down the crashing stones as they formed temporary steps now fallen slices of toast as the building collapsed into rubble and dust. Looking back, I could see some of the stones rolling toward me in avalanche. I ran and ran, each step lengthening like that of an ice skating racer, and soon each of my strides covered 30 feet or more, sweeping long and true like broad jumps strung together until I needed not even come down to ground. I floated a few feet above the road until reaching home. There I collected my sleeping bag and headed for the stone wall next to the pine tree and lay me down for a sleep already within a sleep. I soon reached out and touched the stacked stones, felt their warmth and soon lost all consciousness. That's it. That's all I wrote. Hooray! Some say that the day should begin at 6 a.m with first light, and I would almost agree, however, by the dawn of reckoning, the mood of the day has often been already set by the tones of dreams, and so for me the day begins with midnight. As I awoke and reviewed my dreams again, I knew that it would be another good day. I could no longer remember a bad one, perhaps like a stable weather pattern, the good days inspired good dreams and vice versa, ad infinitum. 
The Daily Almanac came on the radio and I was alert to listen, though still assured of staying in bed another 45 minutes. There was no hurry. This time was planned. I got up, turned on the heat, dressed, fed the cats and put on the eggs, bacon and sausages. Opening the door to get the newspaper, I inhaled that wonderful deep drought of cool outdoor air during that first moment in which one is immune to even the lowest temperatures. This was followed by a drink of water from the well. I felt its coldness flow all the way down to my stomach. I love it, Peter. It demonstrates the true excitement of everyday life, especially during the time of sleep which most people feel is a big blank but is actually a wondrous time if you're aware of it. Like a movie filmed in Cinemascope and 3D, a virtual reality in which you can script and star. Yes, I'm trying to show that everyday life can be much more than ordinary if people would just live it. Money and fame are not required. Our everyday life is exciting. Yes, we find glory in everyday things like walking, reading, working, nature, talking, dining and loving. And in meeting friends, giving love to relatives and families, a glass of water from the well, fresh air, swinging on a porch swing, being together. Yes, it's a life available to everyone, but it takes a certain style and attitude of openness and spontaneity. A lot of people just complain and sit around not acting on their dreams. Like robots, they run the same old rat race, rush, rush. They give their time to hurry's worry. And so they ever go breathless back and forth in the scurry. Focusing straight ahead, the balance all blurry. Cold, unseeing, blinded by the flurry. Yes, and when the angels of opportunity came to visit them, they didn't even know they were there. And Peter, neither did they love. No, angel, they hoarded their love or couldn't bother with it. Living well is more a matter of ready reaction to opportunity than a calculated, scheduled, ponderous activity. And all of Earth's pleasures are greatly increased when you have someone to share the living with. The excitement is more. We're a good match. We are open. And giving. I love you. An angel came to visit me. St. Peter has arrived. I love you so very much. 